You're good. It's, it's loud. All right. All right. All right. Thanks to my production team. We are good to go. And uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. We're going to be in the book of Acts again. As um, last time we were together, we talked about the troublemakers. And um, we're still going to be on this series about troublemakers in the book of Acts. We're going to be in um, Acts chapter 18. However, I want you guys to go over, first of all, to um, chapter 3 of the Gospel of John first. And then we're going to go over to Acts 18. Because that's where we're going to draw most of our material from or most of our teaching from in Acts chapter 18. But the subtopic for troublemakers today is uh, the tornadoes of change, or simply the tornadoes. And so, but we're gonna draw, you see where, where we're coming from in the Gospel of John, first of all, at, in chapter three, starting at verse three. Let me know when you got that, and we're gonna go on, okay? Mm -hmm. Father, thank you, we bless you. Do what you're going to do. We're just grateful to participate with you in this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, the Gospel of John, chapter 3, mm -hmm. starting at verse 3, and I'm just going to read 3 through 8. We're all familiar with this. It says, Jesus answered and said to him, talking about Nicodemus, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born? When he is old, he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Yes, simply Jesus put it, that, put it this way. Unless you're a human, you can't see the kingdom of God. And let's put it this way. Unless you're a human, you cannot receive salvation. So, therefore, angels cannot receive salvation because they're not born of water. They weren't birthed. They were created. So, they never had a need. They don't have a need for salvation because um, they're not human. So, that's his way of just saying, simply saying that, the way he's talking and using that particular idiom. And watch this. He says, uh, but this is where we want to gather the, 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 uh, the topic from, the tornadoes of change. He says... Uh, do not be afraid, I mean amazed, that I said to you, well, let's go back up to verse 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. Now, did y'all catch that when he told Nicodemus after he said about the being born of the water and spirit? In chapter 6, he says, I mean, verse 6, he says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. Humans, your natural birth, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. And he goes from capital S to small s. So he said those who are born of the spirit, which is the Holy Spirit, is spirit. Your spiritual life has come into union with God. He said, do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it. But do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So it's everyone who is born of the Spirit. Y'all say to me, watch out. Watch out. Watch out. Here it comes. Here it comes. Hurricane Corne. <laughs> <laughs> say it. Hurricane Corne. All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and so we're going to talk about the tornado of change, which we are those tornadoes. And we draw this from Jesus telling Nicodemus that um, the wind blows wherever it wants to. Nobody knows where it's going. Nobody knows where it's coming from. And nobody knows where it's going. So it's everyone who is born of the Spirit. He said we're just like the Holy Spirit. We're not the Holy Spirit. However, what he's saying here is people know. They don't know. Where you're coming from, and they don't know where you're going, but they can feel your effects. Mm -hmm. Okay, now that we got that out of the way, let's go to Acts chapter 18. And of course, last, the last time we had Bible study, we was in Acts chapter 17. Remember that? When Paul was at the Areopagus, and 
He was out there with all those people who just dared to listen and to tell something new. Remember that? Okay. All right. And so um, he went and began to teach them about all the gods that they were consumed with over in um, in Rome in Athens. And so uh, 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 he began to be troubled in his spirit, and he began to get their attention and talk because a lot of people were around. Remember we read that and it said people just stood around all day mm -hmm. just to listen and to tell something new. So he had an audience. Paul was a master. He was a master at finding a crew and God opens, it, opens up a door for him to be able to speak. And that's how he got in trouble a lot. He was because he was a troublemaker. And that's what God is trying to get us to see in that sense. We actually are the troublemakers. The world don't want to be disturbed. Leave me alone. Leave me and my darkness alone. Let me, you know how people are today. You know, everything is offensive, especially when you start talking, saying stuff like, well, we believe in the institution of marriage between a man and a woman, you know, and, and how God has a baby. They don't want you to say stuff like that. If you say stuff like that, it means that you are hateful. You don't, you're not loving. You're, you're antiquated. That's the old days. We, we don't roll like that no more. They don't accept nothing Jesus. And so we, we and, and, and so they hijacked the civil rights mm -hmm. and now everybody, <laughs> now everybody is victimized. Mm -hmm. And when it comes down to scriptural masculinity, we were just being, um, and the shepherd was just talking about this earlier today. But anyway, we see Paul being a troublemaker going in and out of these particular cities, getting stoned and thrown out, trouble coming, and he's getting thrown out of these cities. But it's amazing because, uh, you know, we don't want our apple cart to be upset. So we're going to start at chapter 18. Starting at verse, verse one, he had just left. He had just been kicked out of uh, out of Athens, and so he is somewhere else. Y'all ready? Mm -hmm. Acts chapter eighteen. After these things, he left. Talking about Paul, left Athens and went to Corinth. We all know about Corinth, don't we? Corinth. Now let me tell you a little bit about their history. Corinth is a one of those. Um, cities greatly influenced by Roman uh, culture and Greek culture and so therefore their gods was uh, basically the same as those in, in Rome. Uh, they just had different names for the same type of gods, uh, Zeus and all them things like that. Corinth was pretty much the New York City of its time because it was a major hub where people would come from all different places. As a matter of fact, it was like they do a lot of trade, like Wall Street, they have commerce, they have ports, you know, like our, uh, like at, at New York, and then you have Miami and Los Angeles, other places, coastal towns where they have seaports, and goods come from all over the world and come there and bring the goods that people are ordering, and they um, sit there at that particular city. So Corinth was like the port of New York. <laughs> Everybody comes and mix it, mixes it up and bring their culture along with them, bring their goods along with them, and, you know, it's just one of those things. So Paul finds himself in, at Corinth. And he found a Jew, verse 2, and he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. He came to them. And because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them, and they were working, for by trade they were tent makers. Mm -hmm. And he was reasoning in the synagogue every Sabbath and trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. And many people see this, and they, they assume that Paul is, see, Paul kept the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. So we are supposed to keep the Sabbath. And Paul is not keeping the Sabbath in the, in the instance that he, this is the only time he, was, he wasn't observing the Sabbath, he knew where the crowd was in. Simple, just simple. And that was his custom. 
Go to where the Jews was at. And one reason, because he gives them the opportunity first. If you notice that, it'll show you that Paul has this pattern when it comes down to wherever he would go. He would go looking for a synagogue and bring the gospel to them first. And usually, as the story went, they would get mad, kick him out, or somebody come behind him and, and, and make up accusations, and they would get mad at Paul, and then he'll go and find some Gentiles. It's amazing how God works. But anyway, this is the story. <clears throat> and he, verse 4 again. And he was, we in first, I mean, we in Acts chapter 18. And he said, and he was reasoning in the synagogue every Sabbath and trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. But when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, watch this. Paul began devoting himself completely to the word, solemnly testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. Now, I wonder why did Luke insert this particular comment here? Because it starts in verse 4, it said, and he was reasoning in the synagogue every Sabbath trying to persuade them. Then it says in verse 5, but when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, he began devoting himself completely to the word. So what is he saying here? That's interesting to me. He starts off reasoning, and now he's devoting himself to the word completely. So what, you have, what we gather here is that when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul let them take over a certain part of this particular ministry in the synagogue. Mm -hmm. And it is, it's not that he didn't go no more, he just let them take over there. And he devoted himself mm -hmm. to, to, to uh, the word of God. Mm -hmm. And this don't mean he didn't have a Bible like you hold it in your hand, Elder. He didn't have a Bible. That's not what he's talking about. Of course, he's talking about the validity of Scripture. He had did have the what was the Septuagint or the uh, Old Testament canon of scripture, which they could use, and we'll see that, how they use that. But nevertheless, what it's saying here is that he had more time to spend in fellowship with God and, and how to preach the gospel whenever he did, because he's not the only one. He was, he was in synagogue, so there were priests and there were rabbis there that he had to contend with. So now that he got help coming alongside him, no man can do it all, can he? No one man can do it all. Whenever you see one man trying to do it all in a church, just keep, keep your antennas up. Controlling. They can become very cultic real quick. Mm -hmm. Start telling you stuff like, you know, uh, no, you can't go on vacation this, this week. Uh, you know, Gene Watts, you, and that brother back there, y'all get married. You have no say so in. Whether you want to or not, do it. And people do it now. You next. <laughs> Watch this now. Verse 6. But when they resisted and blasphemed, he shook out his garment and said to them, Your blood be on your own head. I am clean. From now, from now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Then he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justice, a worshiper of God whose house was next to the synagogue. Watch this. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all his household. And many, excuse me, and many of the Corinthians, when they heard, were believing and being baptized. And the Lord said to Paul in the night by a vision, do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking and do not be silent. For I am with you, and no man will attack you in order to harm you, for I have many people in this city. Mm -hmm. 
Now, what, what people mistakenly, we, we'll read that particular verse and see where uh, Jesus spoke to Paul in the night vision and told him, don't be silent, preach the gospel. And you have people come and they read that and they will take that upon themselves, you know. And they'll put themselves in precarious situations that God didn't really send them to. Simply because this is what God told Paul. So that don't mean, Sheree, if you read that Paul said, God said that to Paul, or Jesus said that to Paul, don't be silent, keep preaching. I have many people in this city, and no, ain't nobody going to harm you. What people do, they're going to read this particular scripture and ask, and say, see, God told me not to be silent. Keep, keep preaching, and I got many people in this city, so I'm going over to North Korea, and I'm going to preach out loud, I'm going to preach with, with the mic in my hand, and, 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 and God going to protect me. And then they go over there, and get hell hostage. And now they cry. <laughs> the brother said, be some big cans. <laughs> Stuff like that. Where we, and it's because we, we take words out of context and apply to ourselves. Mm -hmm. Did God tell you that? You're reading something that happened in Acts. And like I always say, Acts is not a book where we pull doctrine from. It's giving us a narrative. Of, it's telling us what took place. Not telling us what's going to happen in our day and time. Tell us what it's just Luke, the, the 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 doctor, Luke the doctor, who was alone with them, walked with them, was in those places, witnessed much of that stuff, interviewed people who things happened, and wrote this stuff. That's how the that's how the Gospel of Luke came about. Luke didn't walk with Jesus; he wasn't a disciple, but he interviewed um, others who did. Mark, Mark didn't walk with Jesus, but he got a gospel. Peter mm -hmm. don't have a gospel. And he walked with Jesus. Mm -hmm. Isn't it interesting? Mm -hmm. You know? But nevertheless, um, Peter, it, Paul interviewed Peter. You know, Paul didn't walk with Jesus. Right. He had an encounter with Jesus, but he didn't walk. It, it made, I wonder where he was. He was, he was alive. During Jesus' day, I just wonder where he was when all that stuff was going on. That's interesting. You know, but nevertheless, he comes on the scene and acts. Already established as a Pharisee. And anyway, um, let me digress back. So, like I was saying, when Jesus tells Paul to keep on preaching, don't be silent, ain't nobody going to harm you. He's not telling you that wherever you go and preach, ain't nobody going to get at you. <laughs> okay? Now, if he does tell you that, all well and good. But this ain't, he ain't talking to you right here. <laughs> okay, okay. Let's keep going. We're in Acts chapter 18. Okay. Um, <clears throat> verse 11. It says, and he set up there a year and six months. So where is he at? He's in correct. A whole year and six months. However, Luke don't give us much detail of what took place, even though he stayed here pretty much longer than when he, when he stayed in Philippian and in, in Philippi and, and uh even in Rome. It gives us much detail, but Luke is not giving us much detail of the going zone in Corinth. And and I and my speculation is because of what Corinth was. To Paul, they had a lot of conflict there. You know, there, there was a lot going on in Corinth. Y'all, you know, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. You know, uh, Paul had to bring a lot of correction. A lot of things were going on. Paul had to sit straight. They were, they were uh, uh, at, every time they meet, they have supper and do communion. And some folk were starving and the other folk were drunk. And he was addressing all that stuff. But we don't see that here in the book of Acts. And it's left out for a reason, I believe that being the reason, because of so much turmoil. But however, he skates over it. But it's, I still find it interesting that Paul spent, oh, a year and six months, right? Didn't say that? Mm -hmm. A year and six, a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. And he's an apostle. He didn't do that much staying that long because he was always on missionary journey. But God said of him there, it's correct for a year and a half. 
But while Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, proconsul simply means he was the senator, just like you would have a senator or uh, 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 house of representative of North Carolina. But th this is what this guy Gallio was. <clears throat> but while Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him before the judgment seat. Y'all see that? Mm -hmm. The judgment seat. saying, this man persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. Now, was Paul doing that? Mm -hmm. No, he wasn't doing that. And I love how the proconsul, how, how he uh, 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 handled this. But before we go there, they always coming behind Paul. Y'all notice that he, they always come behind Paul and bring our accusations oh. and, you know, false witnesses. That's why Jesus was so hard on them. He said, you know, don't be bringing up false accusations or, or paying somebody to lie for you, you know, the royal, don't you take no more money, go to court and say, I swear to tell the whole truth, you know, do finger like that, I swear to tell the whole truth, that's what the truth. He said, don't be getting these false witnesses on your side, look, this is what I need you to do, you know, I got you, you know, I got that money here. <laughs> and he's like, I'm a blessed church. <laughs> but um, it's it's maybe they, they they would do that, and then they bring this light up, and these are supposed to be mm -hmm. religious people. Yeah, mm -hmm. that is the issue that they're simply religious. They didn't know Jesus, know God. Right. But however, they claim to represent God, so they gonna go and lie on Paul. Mm -hmm. So so God can be wrong. <clears throat> Verse 14. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gadiel said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrong or a vicious crime, O Jews, it would be reasonable for me to put up with you. But if there are questions about words and names in your own law, look out there yourself. I am unwilling to be a judge, to be a judge of these matters. And he drove them away from the judgment seat. In other words, he kicked the case out of court. Mm -hmm. All right. He kicked the case out of court. He said, look, man, y'all bringing him here, wasting my time. Mm -hmm. I ain't got nothing to do. I ain't studying you, your God, or your law. He did nothing to the state. So I'm kicking it out of court. Go. And don't come back up here with this mess. And they all took hold of Sothenes, the leader of the synagogue, and began beating him in front of the judgment seat. I won't tell the kids that now. But Gallio was not concerned about any of these things. I said, man, look, I'm out of here. I'm going to get me a nap. <laughs> Y'all handle that. Well, but when I come back, you need to be gone. But they beat him, and he just left. Man. Yeah, and, and, and it's amazing that how how the world when they see us fighting each other, they sit back and laugh mm -hmm. and mark, 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 mark. Mm -hmm. mark. Thank you. Mm -hmm. They mock us, <laughs> and they they mock us, and we sit there and fight amongst each other, you know. And it's not, and in this case, it's not. Christians fighting Christians is 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 Jews fighting a Christian, you know. But it's still the same to the world. And so they don't want to have nothing to do with it. <clears throat> Paul having remained, wait a minute, let me let me go back to why. Why did they beat su su Sustenes? They beat him because he received Paul. And to receive Paul is to receive Jesus. This man received the gospel. He was a rabbi, a lawyer, meaning a, a teacher of the law in a synagogue. However, he was he he got saved. Mm -hmm. And so they beat him up. <laughs> Y'all leave my church you want to. I'm gonna check you up. <laughs> now let me see you in them streets. <laughs> see you walk. I see you in walk at Walmart in his own site. I'm gonna get you. He 
go ahead and do it. Leave you want to. I mean, that's just stupid, right? But this is pretty much what was going on. <laughs> Shula, you better not leave, Shula. <clears throat> Paul, having remained many days longer, took leave of the brethren and put out to sea for Syria. And with him were Priscilla and Aquila. In Sancria, he had his hair cut, for he was keeping a vow. They came to Ephesus, and he left them there. Now he himself entered the synagogue. See that here again. He Paul up to his, his the same thing that he always do when he goes to different cities and different seaports. And reason with the Jews in the, in the synagogue. And reason with the Jews. When they asked him to stay for, long, for a longer time, he did not consent. But taking leave of them and saying, I will return to you again if God's will. He set sail from Ephesus. Now, this kind of reminds me, just, just briefly, um, somebody wanted uh, me to um, do something. And so when... I considered the situation, and it was good dealing with ministry. Nothing, nothing at all wrong with that. However, it was the circumstances by which they wanted me to do that, um, I, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it at the time. And so just because you, you get it in back don't mean you got to go. That's right. And so Paul said they wanted him to stay. And you would think, after all the rejection Paul has been experiencing, he'd be like, yeah, man, yeah, I stay here, and you know, but he said, look, this is, I, I can't, I, I got to leave. So meaning he, he, didn't, he, didn't, he didn't stay any longer. So it's important, listen, while you're here, get it while you can. The next moment is not promised to you. Look around you, how many people you see in here? Don't count me, don't ask. And a lot of people can't. They don't prioritize. Mm-hmm. Yes. In the um, King James version, it says Paul tarried, mm-hmm. and I was in the um, Rite of Christ Church, mm-hmm. and I had a situation going on, and so the pastor and one of the mothers was tarrying over me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you were tarried that they tarried, huh? Yeah, and. Uh, <laughs> After a while, they were like, let her up. Right. Yeah, let her up. <laughs> that demon too strong. <laughs> so and, go ahead, go ahead. What, I mean, what does that, that mean, you know, to tear it? Well, it, it actually comes from a term where they, where I, I want to get it right to, to see, give you the correct history of it. It, uh, we all, it all means that, you know, like, remember when Jesus told the disciples, when he, when he uh, left, he said, go, he said, y'all remain here in Jerusalem and wait for the promise. And that's what telling me, to wait. And so, um, and so, of course, we know in Acts when it tells about when um, they were all gathered together, we all say they were in the upper room, but they were not in the upper room when the Holy Spirit fell on them. They were out in the street. They were out at a place where um, they were actually out in a court of prayer. I forgot what that place was called. However, uh, and that's when the Holy Spirit came, and everybody saw and witnessed what happened, you know. And um, but this was where they lived, and it says it was over a hundred of them who was waiting until the Holy Spirit, when He came, fell on them. So uh, uh, over a hundred people can't fit in no upper room because, of course, these, these was compact. Buildings, you know what I mean. But anyway, to back to the question, that's where they gather, get it from, and so they figured, well, if we tarry, the Holy Spirit will come and own you because of, for some reason they were thinking because of the situation you had going on, you didn't have the Holy Spirit, so you need the Holy Spirit. That's the only thing I can gather from that by them saying that they were tearing on you, but which is. Uh, for lack of a better term, ignorance. And ignorance really ain't a bad word. It's just when we choose to stay that way. It, it just simply means we don't know no better. And there are a lot of things that we do out of ignorance. We just don't know no better. But once you, there's an opportunity for you to know better, take it. And so people can assume that um, 
if you got something going on in your life that's not what they say it should be, then you ain't got to go through it. And that's not true. And you have all, y'all remember those turning services? Mm -hmm. Y'all had it fast for, what, 125 days? <laughs> yeah, fast for five days, and then come around to the camp. And then, what, then they could get around you, had that towel, and working the altar. See, all that stuff is work. Works righteousness. And and so they did that, and they come around, you gather around. I don't know what to do. Nobody carry me. I guess I won't work carry me I, I, and, and so therefore, when they wait and assume once you start mumbling, uh oh, she got it, she got it, he got it. And you ain't got nothing. Start saying something because you're hungry. But, not, yeah I, yeah, I am mocking that because people still believe that and it's not so. Because, Scripture tells us that once we receive salvation, that is receiving the Holy Spirit. And this is another thing where people get twisted in the book of Acts. Those situations like when it said, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. You know, and they figured that they were telling. They were already saved, but they weren't filled yet. See, that's our problem. We saved, but we ain't filled yet because we ain't speaking in tongues. The Bible never explains, tells us that. Never tells us that the evidence of your salvation is speaking in tongues. Matter of fact, everywhere in, in the Bible where it speaks of tongues, it's translated to God's so languages. He gets new languages. And that's where King James messes a lot of people up. And that's why you get all these doctrines about tongues, because they translated it and left it tongues and did just simply say what God's a mean. They spoke in other languages, known languages. What about my prayer language? No. No. Your prayer language is you speaking what you know. English. What about praying in the spirit? Because that's what you are. In the spirit. You're born. You're born again. Remember what Paul said? Born. Who is born again? You must be born again. That is what's of the flesh is flesh. That which is of the spirit is what? Of the spirit. Spirit. So that's who we are. In the spirit, it is our spiritual location. We were once in Adam, but now we are where? In Christ. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, whatever you speak, you're, 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 you're speaking from the spirit. You're speaking in the spirit. Okay? A lot of people left and assume that it don't work for them, so they leave the church because they don't can't get down with it. And that's just deception. Yes, ma'am. Exactly. And it just rolled off the tongue. Yeah. And it just rolled right off and just sounded so pretty. Exactly. But then it'll make you feel less things. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. There you have it. And that's what everybody who don't do it kind of feel like, well, God don't love me enough or right. something wrong with me. Exactly. Once I get cleaned up real good, I'll be able to do it. Remember I used to uh, try to tell you that? See, I ain't scared to tell them myself. Because I, I just didn't know no guy. Try to get that rock to speak in tongues, he ain't did it yet. <laughs> <laughs> you still catch it, ain't you? <laughs> he ain't gonna get it. Man, you need to get right. I did, I did, you know, like I said. But that that, that was me. I did it because I'm glad he didn't leave. You know, but you know, uh, that's just part of growing, the continuum of learning. I was willing to learn that where I was coming from was from error. And what I was meaning by my heart was, my, my, my intentions was there, right? However, it was coming from a wrong understanding of what scripture tells us. What did Jesus say? How are we gonna know that we belong to him? Our love. Our love that we have for each other. Mm -hmm. So did, it, did I answer both of you? Oh, you didn't answer because you make a comment, I'm sorry. But um, yeah, um, that's what Terry means to wait and then get it from the house that Jesus told the disciples to go away. You know, Ephesians tells us that um, 
once we are once we receive salvation, he tells us that we 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 are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And then you hear people teach this. They say, yeah, you you yeah, that's for salvation, but you need the second blessing. And there's no such thing as a second blessing. The scripture tells us as well in Romans chapter. I think roughly five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. <laughs> then it tells us really, it tells us that um, when God gave us Jesus Christ, he gave us all. He said, how shall he not with him give us all things? Mm -hmm. So he didn't give you Christ and then withhold the Holy yes, Spirit. Yes, to receive Christ is to receive the Holy Spirit. That's what happens when and I'm teaching this um, next week, Lord willing, and now um, Bible mechanics class, the, the, the gaps that got to be filled in and why there's so many uh, error, erroneous Bible beliefs is because those gaps ain't filled in that needed to be filled in where we misunderstand language that they use. I can add, and they use it, they will fill with the spirit and so we assume that means that uh, uh, they, they was, and it's just, put it this way, what Lucas intended to say is that they got saved. We, they just didn't use that language that we use now. Mm -hmm. They said, yeah, man, um, we was over there, and the next thing you know, he was preaching, and I was filled with the Spirit. They said, I received salvation. That's what, we would say that. I believe I received salvation. Only, the, the difference is what, what God was doing in Acts, he's establishing this new thing called the church. Remember when, when God said to you, Isaiah, I'll do a new thing? Mm -hmm. That was the new thing. He ain't doing nothing else new. Putting his spirit inside of you at the moment of salvation is the new thing. Because that wasn't done since Adam mm -hmm. and fell. So, yeah. And like I said, those language gaps contribute to our erroneous interpretation of Scripture because we just don't say the same, see it the same way. And we assume it means something because there's a language gap there. <clears throat> verse 19. Acts 18, verse 19. They came to Ephesus and he left them there. Now he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they, when they asked him to stay for a longer time, he did not consent, but taking leave of them and saying, I will, excuse me, I will return to you again if God's will. He set sail from Ephesus. When he had landed at Caesarea or Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church and went down to Antioch. And having spent time there, he left and passed successfully to the Galatian region in Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. Now, Jew named Apollos, an Alexandrian by birth, y'all know what that means? He was a um, Zephyr. Alexandria is ancient Egypt. Well, not ancient, well, Egypt is Egypt, which is in Africa. <clears throat> Now, Jew named Apollos and Alexandria, by birth, an eloquent man, came to Ephesus, and he was mighty in the scriptures. See that? Watch this. I'm going to say that again. Now, a Jew named Apollos and Alexandria by birth. See, he was a Jew, but he was, his nationality was African. Mm -hmm. That don't mean he was a black man. It just means he was a Jew whose nationality was um. Alexandria by birth. Mm -hmm. So that's explaining two different things. It's explaining a, a race and a nationality. Okay? Mm -hmm. So if Sheree was, no, let me, I'm, I can't use you this time because you might be getting tired of me using you. So let me use Miss Bryant. <laughs> so if Miss Bryant was born in Russia, she would be Russian by birth. But both my parents are black. So her nationality don't change who she is. By race or by ethnicity. Okay? See how that works? All right, all right. 
He was an eloquent man, came to Ephesus, and he was mighty in the scriptures. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord. And being fervent in spirit, he was speaking and teaching accurately the things concerning Jesus being acquainted only with the baptism of John. Paul, oh, wait a minute, let's keep going. And he began to speak out boldly in the synagogue. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Pause. This is, this is so good to me. So he was in the synagogue, and of course, so that he had, he, he Jew, he's Jewish. So he was able to go into the synagogue, and he was able to speak in the synagogue. So it says that he was so mighty in the scriptures, but the only, the only uh, 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 gospel he know, he didn't really know the gospel. But he knew about the baptism, he knew about John's, John the Baptist's ministry. And so this guy is so tough and eloquent and know how to break that thing down that he was in the synagogue teaching them, showing them, only knowing John's baptism and turned them up when it comes down to the gospel. He just didn't know the full scope of it. And it says that, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. See, that's what we're supposed to do. That's what discipleship means. Discipleship means that you have, we walk with each other and we talk with each other and we learn from each other. That we both, we grow, we do life together, growing up in God, in Christ together. He didn't see to tell them, look now, I know more Bible than you know. Didn't you hear me speak? I'm eloquent. He said they just took him and explained to him the gospel. I can see how that conversation went down. I said, Paulus, come in, man. Look, we heard coming in, man. You, you talking that stuff. It was awesome. I, 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 I listened. He was so accurate with it. But let, 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 me, let me show you this right here. Look at you right here. This, this right here. This right here, and it's just saying that they explained to him what it, that, uh, the ways of God more accurately, meaning they was bringing him up to par with the reality of Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, so he could get the full scope of it. He only knew John's gospel. Remember, there was a situation, I think, over in Acts 12. But when Paul um, ran upon some of John's disciples. You know, see, when John the Baptist died, his disciples scattered. And a lot of them, they didn't, they, they didn't know what had took place after John died. So they went somewhere else, over in Rome and Greece, far out reaches. And they, was just, they kept, they held on to his teachings, but that's all they knew. They didn't know that Jesus had died and was resurrected and the Holy Spirit and the church was established. And it said that um, when they asked him, well, when Paul asked them, well, what do you know? What, what, what baptism? I see y'all out here baptizing folks. He said, what, what are you doing? And they told him what they were doing. And he said, oh, okay. Let me tell, show you something. And he taught them the gospel. And it says that they received the Holy Spirit. And he began to speak, with, speak other languages. And that's what God was doing in that particular time. Establishing the church. And so he was doing these miracles by their hands. To help strengthen people to believe what is being taught concerning the grace of God. I believe myself, I believe Apollos wrote the book of Hebrews. Myself, I have my reasons, but nevertheless, anyway. <clears throat> but when, verse 27, and we're going to close it here. And when he wanted to go across Achaia, the brethren encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. And when he had arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. This is talking about Paul. For he powerfully refuted, I mean Apollos, for he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, demonstrating by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. Amen. The tornadoes of change. That was the subject today. Troublemakers. In the Troublemaker series, the tornadoes of change, the winds, 
the winds of the Holy Spirit in each and every one of you is the potential for God to do what he's going to do in your life wherever you go. And that's the beauty of being troublemakers because you are filled with the Holy Spirit of God to, to, to and what, he, what they get to look like only he knows. And you get to trust them. How about that? No, no, that ain't that beautiful? Just, we just too nosy. We want to know before we go. <laughs> they're going to be mad at Jesus. <laughs> and so that's, that's the beauty of being a troublemaker for the gospel. You don't go looking for trouble. It's going to find you. Why? Because you're in Christ. It's because you're in Christ. And so therefore, if you're in Christ, the world just don't like you. Sorry, but not. Okay, we can shut it down. Any questions, comments, anyone? Before we let you go?